In our last lesson, we learned that your baptism was the point where God blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, the law that was contrary to you, taking it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. Ephesians tells us that he blotted it out and abolished it in the death of his son. What this means is that law can no longer condemn those that are in Christ Jesus. The law of condemnation has been removed. It was a glad day when you were baptized into Christ because you were lifted up above the condemnation of God for there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, to them who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. In Christ Jesus you are married to him and are able to bring forth fruit unto God. That is to say the divine life the divine nature expresses itself through your mind, through your capacities, through your abilities. God does his work through you. You are sanctified, set apart, and enabled to be a worker of God, a laborer together with God, the book of Corinthians calls it. Now you may have observed in our lessons thus far that we have not emphasized the form of baptism, that is immersion, being buried in water. The reason for this is we are taking a more apostolic approach at this first to show what has been accomplished in your baptism. Once you see what has been accomplished, it will become clear to you that immersion is the only possible way you can be baptized into Christ. Even though this is supported by etymology and the meaning of the word, yet the meaning of the doctrine is what establishes the absolute necessity of immersion. We are buried with Christ by baptism into death, thus requiring immersion. What a blessing it is that you have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Such key things have been associated with your baptism. Things that if you discern will bring confidence and victory to you. If you perceive somewhat of what has been accomplished in your baptism, you will be enabled to fight a good fight of faith, to resist the devil, and to reach heaven, which should be your main and primary objective. One of the primary purposes observed by the law was the development of a divine vocabulary, a nomenclature, a means of speech by which God could communicate with man. One of those words, as we have discussed already, is washing. You have been washed from your sins in your baptism. This word washing was developed under the law and given a meaning that pertained to cleansing and to personal involvement. One of the things you see here about the nature of God is that he wants to communicate his mind to men. He does not want to be mysterious. He does not want his will and his salvation to be mysterious. He wants it to be understood. And so developed under the law and the prophets a particular language and speech, key words with which he might communicate the truth of salvation to men. Faith lays hold of spiritual substance, unseen reality. In the words of Scripture, faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Beyond this world, beyond the world of sense and time, of feeling and touch, there's an unseen world filled and teeming with spiritual realities, a world where God resides. Faith can get a hold of the realities there if it has words that convey precisely to the heart those realities. These are the words God developed, words that precisely depict spiritual realities he wants you to appropriate. Have you thought of the key words that are connected with your baptism? Words that we have discussed thus far. Very central words. You have been saved through your baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16 states. While Peter asserts, in 1 Peter 3, 21, that baptism doth now also save us. We have been buried with Christ, and burial of Christ is part of the gospel, as is proclaimed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. We have been raised in our baptism with Christ, and we have been washed from our sins in our baptism. Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13 says, In our baptism we were quickened or made alive by the living God. We were buried by baptism into Christ's death. And we, by believing and being baptized, have appropriated salvation. Baptism is associated with the remission of sins and being delivered from the law. Now as you view these things, none of them are incidental. 
Not a single one of them are things that should be ignored. All of them are absolutely primary, absolutely significant, and they have been associated with your baptism. Nowhere in all of God's Word is baptism viewed as unimportant, insignificant, or associated with small things. And you must not permit man of any sort to deprive you of the blessedness of your baptism. We want to associate your baptism in this lesson with the circumcision of Christ. Before this is over, we want you to be thoroughly conversant with this glorious benefit. Our text is found in Colossians, the second chapter, verses 11 and 12. In whom, that is in Christ, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. That phrase, through faith in the operation of God, is an old way of saying, by believing that God was going to perform this operation of circumcision. You were confident it would be accomplished, and it was. The circumcision of Christ. <clears throat> Again, under the law and prior to the law with Abraham, God developed the concept of circumcision, so that when he employed this word, in the New Testament writings, it would carry significance to his people. It actually was established with Abraham, called the father of the faithful, because of his pioneering spirit in believing God. In Genesis, the 17th chapter, verses 10 through 14, and it will be of value to us to, re to rehearse this establishment of circumcision. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that is born in the house, or bought with money, or of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be with your flesh for an, un, for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Well, when you read these words about circumcision, you immediately attach an element of importance to them. Circumcision was identified with being in God's covenant and being uncircumcised demanded a cutting off from the covenant, a very pivotal issue indeed. Now in referring to circumcision, we ought to say that it was a sign and a seal. This is the apostolic reference to the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision. In Romans the fourth chapter and verse 11, commenting on this very text that we have just read in Genesis, the word of the Lord says, He, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. A sign or an indication of God's approval, and a seal, a means of divine commitment, has been attached to the word circumcision. From this point on, when we think of circumcision, we think of it being a sign or an indication and a seal, a personal mark, of divine approval. Again, in the book of Acts, the seventh chapter in verse 8, where Stephen is preaching that sermon that consummated in his stoning, he had this to say about circumcision. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. Here Stephen equates the circumcision with the covenant God made with Abraham to bless the world through him and through his seed. Also, circumcision was employed under the law of Moses. It was so stern in those days that those that were not circumcised were considered cut off from God and alienated from the promises. In fact, Paul employs this very language in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter and verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called a circumcision in the flesh made with hands. We see here then the divine associations that have been made with circumcision. 
one of which is acceptance, divine acceptance. The circumcised individual was accepted by God. The uncircumcised one was cut off from God. Circumcision was also a means of personal identification with God. It also was experienced. It was not a philosophy, not an idea, but an actual experience, something in which the individual personally participated. And circumcision had to do with the unseen or the private parts. It was something more appreciated personally than it was publicly. It was something that was very aware to the individual, but perhaps not to those all about him. Circumcision in the unseen and private parts, and not the least of which it was associated with God's covenant. Now God also spoke of circumcision figuratively or spiritually, as we would say in the New Covenant. That is to say, his primary objective in circumcision was not to establish a mere physical right. He was developing a concept by which he could communicate spiritual thoughts. Now we have three instances in the Old Scriptures in which the word circumcise is used in a spiritual or figurative sense. The first is found in the book of Exodus, the sixth chapter in verse 12, and it records Moses' words to our Lord after he had been called to deliver his children Israel. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? That is to say, my lips are incapable of uttering the words that I feel would be acceptable in your behalf. Uncircumcised lips. Another use of circumcision is found in the book of Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, and verse 16. And here again is quite an amazing word brought by our Lord. Again, he's developing a concept of circumcision. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Stiff-necked in Scripture means that they were unwilling to turn about and follow God. And here God equates the circumcision of the heart with being willing to turn and follow God, a circumcised heart. One further uh, reference to circumcision is found in the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah refers to the circumcision of the ears. Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, and verse 10. Who shall I speak and give warning? that they may hear. Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Uncircumcised ears, a growth, a spiritual growth had overshadowed their capacity to hear the word of the Lord. Thus God brings to our attention that circumcision really has to do with something more than the flesh. It has to do with the lips, with the heart, and with the ears with man's ability to speak the things of God, follow and turn to God willingly, and to hear the things of God. Spiritual circumcision was promised in the Word of God. And it would do good for us just to read what God has to say about this. In the book of Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, and verse 6, God speaks to His people about circumcision. <clears throat> and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Now every time I read that text of Scripture, I remember that first and great commandment. The first and greatest commandment is this, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first and great commandment. God, foreseeing the absolute necessity of this, told his people the day is are going to come when I will circumcise your heart so that you can love me with all of your heart and soul and mind, so that you can live. You see, you cannot live, be receptive, have response to God unless your heart is circumcised, unless the thing that inhibits your heart from reaching out to God is cut away by the circumcision of Christ. 
Paul, in elaborating on circumcision, tells us that it was not of the flesh, that real circumcision was of the Spirit. In Romans, the second chapter, we read these words in verse 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is of men and not of God. So a real Jew is one that is one inside, and real circumcision is when the heart is circumcised according to God's promise in Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. When a person has praise of God, when God commends that individual rather than men. Now let me ask you this, believer, baptized believer, are you aware of the fact that God has commended you in Christ Jesus? He has accepted you and he praises you in Christ Jesus. You have been circumcised of things that were offensive to God. The part of your nature that was offensive to him, that he could not tolerate, that was in words of scripture abominable to him, has been cut off by Jesus Christ. The circumcision of Christ. When a person is circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, the circumcision of the heart, there is a removal of confidence in the flesh. Philippians, the third chapter, in verse 3, the apostle said this, We are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. That is to say, we do not place reliance upon outward ceremonies and rituals and activities. It's not a form that brings us to God, not a routine, not a catechism, if you please. What brings us to God is our faith in Christ, which provokes this obedience to be baptized into him. We have no confidence in the flesh, things that men invent, things that men create, the traditions of men called by Peter the vain traditions. Our confidence is in the Lord because we have experienced the circumcision of Christ. Why is it that some people are unable to trust God, to rely upon Christ, to depend upon him for giving their sins? It's because their heart has not been circumcised. Oh, you must believe this, that in Christ Jesus, when you were baptized into him, your heart was circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. The result is that you have a character that's acceptable to God. It's your person that he receives. Can you see that? He receives you personally, not just what you have done. Your affections now are renewed toward God. Even though you may not be perfect in what you have achieved, you have still sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are still disappointments in your personal achievements, and yet you have a desire to seek the Lord. You have a fervent ambition to please him. Oh, I love I thy law, you confess with David. And with Paul you say, with my mind, I myself serve the law of God. How is such a wonderful thing possible? You can no doubt remember when you didn't want to serve God, when you didn't care about pleasing him, but now you do. Why? It's because your heart has been circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision is something to which you must submit. Back in the book of Joshua, the fifth chapter, verses two through five, God commanded Joshua to circumcise all the males that were uncircumcised as a result of the wilderness journey from Egypt to the promised land. Those men had to submit to be circumcised, and so do you have to submit to spiritual circumcision. That's why it's connected with your baptism. It would be difficult indeed to identify when Christ cut off the part of your heart that was offensive to God were it not for your baptism. That was the day, the day you were baptized, when Jesus Christ performed that heavenly surgery and circumcised your heart. Buried with him by baptism into death was a commentary on being circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. Now the body of the sins of the flesh have been cut off. Such a wonderful text of Scripture. Colossians, the second chapter, 
and verse 11. And I think it merits us looking into it a little closer. Because here we have a statement that is difficult to receive. But I want to urge you with every part of my being to receive this text of Scripture as the truth for you. We are not now speaking to a group of individuals. We are speaking to you. You receive this truth. Colossians 2.11 In whom, that's in Christ, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Now let's take a moment and comment upon this. It may be of help to you to hear this verse from other translations of Scripture. Today's English version takes that text and translates it this way. Freed from the power of the sinful body. Let's take another version. The New International Version says, Putting off of your sinful nature. Again, the Living Bible translates it this way, sets you free from your sinful desires. The Jerusalem Bible translates it, complete stripping of your body of flesh. While the New English Bible translates it, being divested of the lower nature. Now, friend, we go here beyond forgiveness. We go beyond the remission of sins into an area that only faith can grasp. Now I want to urge you as we proclaim this to let your faith extend out and embrace the Word of God. God who cannot lie has made this assertion. What Jesus did when He circumcised your heart was He cut off the body of the sins of the flesh. He freed you from the lower nature. He released you from the power of sin. He robbed the flesh, your lower nature, your unregenerate nature. He robbed it of its power. Now looking into this further, what he is saying is, sin has lost its dominion since you have been circumcised in Christ Jesus. In Romans the 6th chapter and verse 4, we summon you now to believe this, to let your faith lay hold of this and transcend what appears to be your experience. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now you'll recall in one of our previous lessons that in your baptism the law was spoiled, nailed to the cross, taken out of the way, and abolished. You're not under the law, it can't condemn you. And because it can't, the apostle writes, this is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin is inferior to you. You can gain the victory over sin because of the circumcision of Christ Jesus. You can keep under your body, as 1 Corinthians 9, 27 states, there Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. That is, you are capable of subduing your lower nature and those baser desires that concern you. You can subdue them because of the circumcision of Christ Jesus. You can, in accordance with 2 Corinthians the seventh chapter and verse 1, you can cleanse yourself of all filthiness of flesh and spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. Jesus, by circumcising your heart, has cut away the dominance of sin. It is not the prevailing part of your nature anymore. If it seems like it is, your seamer is wrong. You are seeing it wrong. You must believe the word of the Lord. You have been buried with Christ by baptism into death, and while you were buried there, God performed an operation through Jesus Christ. He cut away the whole sinful nature and loosed it from you so that you did not have to live under its dominion anymore. You receive now a new set of affections a new set of desires. Your heart begins to be knit with the Lord. Now here's the challenge of Colossians, the third chapter, and you must receive it. Take it seriously. If ye then be risen with Christ, and remember we're risen with Christ by baptism. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. 
sets your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That occurred because of Christ's circumcision. He separated you from your sinful nature in God's sight, which means you can gain the dominance over it. You are not a slave to it. You do not have to sin. You're no longer powerless, child of God. Satan may try to convince you that you are, but you have experienced the operation of God, the circumcision of the sinful nature. Believe the word of God and push out contrary notions. Now let's review briefly what we have seen in this most valuable and precious lesson. In your baptism, you experience the circumcision, the cutting away of the old nature, the sinful nature, the inclination to sin becomes secondary, not primary. Before you're in Christ, your sinful nature, your desire to sin is the main part of you. Now it's the secondary part of you. It does exist. We would not play the role of a fool and deny that it's there, but it's secondary. It can be denied. You are now to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. God spoke about circumcision, the type of circumcision you enjoy in Christ Jesus even of old time. He talked about a heart being circumcised, being made new, the thing that restricted the heart being removed, the thing that inhibited the heart from loving God and submitting to God, being removed by Jesus Christ. You did not remove it. Jesus removed it when you were baptized. The body of the sins of the flesh cut off. Your ear began to be circumcised like Jeremiah's, and you were able to hear the word of the Lord and to respond to the good things of God. Now, fellow believer, what I have told you is the truth. In your baptism, you were circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. The sins of the flesh were cut away. You are capable of denying ungodliness. You are capable of pleasing God. Now, go in the strength of the truth, believe it, and do it.